National Security Force. His name is Bruce Gold. Look, he's putting his weapon down and no one is getting killed. I am I'm just surprised, you know. Adam Petrowski, Sergeant Mansfield, and fellow gun owners. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words today. I look around and all I can say is wow. What are all these people doing here with guns? Today, my friends, I stand in front of you feeling pretty safe. Looking around, I see people who understand freedom, who understand the American way, who understand the Constitution, Bill of Rights, and the right of everyone to own firearms, carry firearms, and most importantly, the right, if necessary, to protect ourselves and families. All around the country, there are attacks on the rights of law-abiding citizens to carry, either concealed or open. Law-abiding citizens. This is the key phrase. Law-abiding citizens. If someone breaks into my house, what should I do? Tell them my house is a gun-free zone? You can't come in here. You can't come in here carrying that gun. I don't think so. If someone tries to hurt my wife or kids, what should I say? Please don't do that? I don't think so. Deadly force is never a great option, but sometimes it's the best option or the only option. The Founding Fathers knew that. Thomas Jefferson knew that. Aaron Burr, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington knew that. Look, even, uh, even our young patriots in training know that. <laughs> Unfortunately, some of the people in office today, both local and nationally, don't seem to know that. I urge all of you today, just as you were doing today, to be involved. Write your legislators, share your opinion, no matter what it might be. You always must stand up for what is right. And if that means you have to pull a weapon out of your holster or your jacket pocket for protection, you must have the right to do that. Stay safe, stay protected, and God bless all of you. All right, Bruce Gold, everybody, give it up for him. Okay, next speaker is my lovely wife. Jackie Petrowski, she's an activist, and she's the co-founder of Citizens for Liberty. Jackie Petrowski, everybody. Sorry, I'm not doing a a three-year-old and a five-year-old. If you have kids, you understand. Uh, again, can you hear me? No. Uh, well, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me now? Screaming. Hello? Hello. 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 Can you hear me now? Thank you all for coming, and again, thank, uh, thank you Adam for hosting this. Uh, we did this all on his own. We had a rally here last year, and um, I'm up there you hold this <laughs> uh, we had a rally here, here last year, and me and Steve decided that we weren't going to have another one, and he said he wanted to do it, so we support him 100% on this. <laughs> Adam requested that I speak about what the Second Amendment means to me. Well, to me, the Second Amendment means freedom. Second Amendment protects our rights. Questions have been asked about the relevance of this rally. 
Do we honestly believe that because the media aren't talking about guns right now, the threat of taking them away has gone? The people that are, the history has shown that as soon as we rest on the issue, those in control go for force on its destruction. We cannot and will not change the Constitution. What we have to do is get politicians to listen. They work for us. It's time to have them hear our voice. We must remain vigilant. We've handed over control of our money with the Federal Reserve. We've handed over control of our health care with Obamacare. <laughs> give up your guns, give up your rights. Easy as that. What part of shall not be infringed do they not understand? If they take our guns away, what's stopping them from taking our land? If they take our guns away, what's stopping them from taking all of our money? If they take our guns away, what's stopping them from taking our children? We owe it to our children, our grandchildren, our future and their future to protect their rights, stand up for it now so that they don't have to. We're normal people. I'm a teacher. I'm just a normal person fighting, armed with knowledge and the Constitution, fighting today for a better tomorrow. Kneel chained or stand or stand up for freedom or kneel chained. Our time is now. Thank you. Welcome. All right, thank you, Jackie. That was a good speech. Next up, I have this gentleman. He was a former progressive turned constitutionalist. Let's give him a big hand. Dan Gray. I had a speech uh, on three by five cards for today, but I'm going to do something different. I'll tell you what happened to me on the way down here and what it means. I was stopped by the police. Oh, and it wasn't a targeted stop. They, just because I'm getting prominent and I'm public with uh, my dissatisfaction with the government, that wasn't why they stopped me. And it wasn't a random stop. I was driving too fast. It's near the end of the month, and with all this snow, they just haven't been able to get their revenue. Yep. Uh -huh. So he stopped me and he asked me for my papers, and I gave them to him. He asked me if I knew how fast I was going, and I said, yes, I did, and I told him how fast I was going. And he said, wait. So I waited, and he checked me out to make certain that I had no felony warrants or anything else against me. He noticed the bumper stickers on my car, and came over and asked me, if I had a weapon in the car, and of course I said yes, because I wasn't going to lie. And he asked to see it, and I opened the trunk and let him see my shotgun. He asked if I had anything else I should know about. And I figured, let's go for broke. And I told him, yeah, well, during all the snow emergencies we've had, there's a, an unopened glass in my car with hard liquor in it. <laughs> The long and short of it is, he didn't write me a ticket. He didn't write me a warning. He didn't give me a verbal warning. What he did was spend 20 minutes discussing why what I was doing here today, because he asked that and I told him, was important. And he confessed that even though he is a sworn law enforcement officer who follows his orders, he is also an oath keeper and several decades with NRA ILA. Yeah. Yeah. And this reminds me of what's going on in the Ukraine today. And even though the press is not reporting it, what's going on in Venezuela today, and the difference between those two and between those two and this country. In Ukraine, just this morning, police officers went to the other side. They stopped fighting the protesters and joined them. In Venezuela, where it's been a nasty dictatorship for a lot longer, they didn't. In fact, they're not just firing on protesters who are attacking them with bricks. They're firing on innocent civilians who aren't even protesting. They're going door to door. They're kicking down doors. They're shooting people on their lists. They're shooting people who they think might resist. That's the difference between Ukraine and Venezuela. But there's a big difference between those countries and America, and that is this. Yeah. 
right. There are 100 million Americans in this country. One third of this country owns firearms. And we own an average of three firearms apiece, and some, like my friend here who's speaking next, own many more than that. <laughs> Just collectors. Just collectors. But the reason why governments, when they go bad, when they abuse their power, when they realize that they're in danger of losing their power, and they decide to actually take arms against the people, are stopped is not because we shoot them. I don't want it to come to that. If it comes to that, we're ready. But we don't want that. We have families, we have jobs, we have homes, we have neighbors, we have children. War is a bad thing. There are two things we must do and we can do to make certain that we retain our freedoms and liberties. <coughs> One is to retain our guns. We outnumber them. We outgun them. We surround them. They're fools if they think that they could win that sort of battle, but the cost would be tremendous. The other thing, and I know most of you probably already do this, and if you don't get started, and if you know friends, family, that you can talk into doing this, peaceful resistance. And that doesn't just mean showing up at rallies or open carrying. That doesn't just mean signing petitions. That means working for candidates on a local level who are going to make a difference. There are a lot of patriot candidates who are coming up. A lot of Republicans, a few Democrats, libertarians. Oh. Honest to God, there is actually one of them. Oh. <laughs> uh, to the fifth. <laughs> right there. If we retain our arms and we do not give up this fight, we can and will win and the reason we will win is because we have no choice. There is no choice when the choice is freedom or slavery for our children. Here come the sirens. I think we're in trouble. We'll wait for that. I could say a lot more, but I think I've said enough. I've been told by our wonderful videographer that I tend to ramble a bit. <laughs> so I'll just leave you with this. More lobby! All right, our next speaker, his name is John Rensler. He's the founder of the Pennsylvania 3% Club. He's a military historian, a firearms expert, and he's also a member of Citizens for Liberty. John Rentschler, everybody. All right, yay! Woo! <laughs> Come hell, John. Come hell, John. Come on, John. Come on, Johnny Rip. Fellow patriots, as an educator, I have taught history of our nation to thousands over the course of my historical career. Today, I will present you with the historical tools to take the fight to the enemy and strengthen your own resolve. As a lover of history, I'm also a great lover of literature. <coughs> this current government brings no better example of literature to mind than George Orwell's 1984. Yeah. In his book he wrote, until they become conscious, they will never rebel. And until after they have rebelled, they cannot become <laughs> conscious. Rebel, my brothers and sisters. Revolution is not a dirty word or a thing to fear. It is in your blood. It is the very instrument of freedom which will save this country we love. All our founders did it, not for greed, but for love of freedom. Freedom this land promised. Even in the days before the invention of firearms, ancient wise men advocated owning a sword. Aristotle, a sage long before our founders, stated, tyranny derives from the oligarchy's mistrust of the people. Hence, they deprive them of arms, ill-treat the lower class, and keep them from residing in the capital. These are common to oligarchy and tyranny. What do you think? Folks, today we are living in such an oligarchy. We are no longer of the people and for the people, but of a group of corrupt elites, and for them. Come out, John. To understand freedom, we must listen to the men who crafted our nation. 
The rule of tyrants and how to deal with them is often spoken of by our founders as something which can only be remedied by private citizens with arms and the tyrants at the end of ropes. In the foundation of the country, the founders never distinguished between military arms and civilian pistols or cannons, muskets or fowl or bayonet or not. What these men were adamant about was that firearms were made to secure liberty, not just to hunt or target shoot. That's right. Thomas Jefferson once said, no free man shall ever be debarred the use of arms. At the Virginia Ratified Convention, which met in June 1788, Edmund Pendleton, opponent of Bill of Rights and obviously opposed to firearms ownership, weakly argued that the abuse of power could be remedied by recalling the delegated powers in a convention. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Deal with tyrants with reprimands and hearings. Patrick Henry shot back, the power to resist oppression rises, rests upon the right to possess arms. Guard with jealous attention the public liberty. Suspect everyone who approaches that jewel. Unfortunately, nothing will preserve it but downright force. Whenever you give up force, you are ruined. Henry sneered, oh sir, we should have a fine time indeed. If to punish tyrants, it would only be sufficient to assemble the people. Your arms, wherewith you could defend yourselves, are gone. Did you ever read of any revolution in a nation inflicted by those who had no power at all? Here's another quote from 1984. Now I will tell you the answer to my question. It is this. The party seeks power entirely for its own sake. We are not interested in the good of others. We are interested solely in power, pure power. And what power means, you will understand presently. We are different from uh, oligarchies of the past. Now we know what we were doing. All the others, even those who resemble ourselves, were cowards and hypocrites. The, Dem the German Nazis and the Russian Communists came very close to us in their methods. But they have never had the courage to recognize their own motives. They pretend, perhaps, they believe that they had seized power unwillingly and for a limited time. But that was just around the corner and lay a paradise where human beings would be equal and free. We're not like that. We know that what no one ever seizes power with the intention of relinquishing it. Power is not a means but an end. One does not establish a dictatorship to safeguard a revolution. One makes the revolution to establish a dictatorship. That was from 1984. So no, Barry Sotero or Barack Obama or whoever you are, 1984 is not a roadmap to success. It's not a plan of action. This book was a warning. And we should have been heeding it all along. All right, John. World history is a gun control of who's who of tyrants and dictators and genocidal madmen. The 20th century has witnessed the likes of Hitler, Stalin, and Mao. Between just these three men lay the corpses of hundreds of millions of disarmed souls, men, women, children, and babies, all dead in the name of the progressive agenda. Lenin came in as a liberator, or so he claimed. And in short time, the new party motto had become, I will bury you. Are you shovel ready yet? Hell no! In October 1918, the Council of People's Commissars, the Commons government, ordered citizens to surrender all firearms, ammunition, and sabers, having first mandated registration of all weapons six months earlier. Sound familiar? No. Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, Mao, Castro, and all the others came to office for hope and change. And Lincoln. <laughs> yep, and Lincoln. All were allowed to use executive action to make law and circumvent Congress. All replaced judges and politicians who didn't agree with them, with the ones who did. All purged military generals to control the armed forces. All favored gun control. And all killed anyone they wanted to as well, once that was done. In what world does two plus two not equal four? What would have happened if these souls had not given to the urge to compromise? 
to, to tolerate the agenda of others and hadn't had a Congress flooded with the corrupted courts filled with political appointees of a dictator. That's right. If only these men, women, and children who now lie in mass graves, ovens, and holes in the woods could stand up today and speak, maybe our citizens would not be so inclined to squander our freedoms. These souls have been ever for forever silenced by the hand of a benevolent leader who had a utopian dream of a world under the rule of one government. And one man, a world where the helpless are exterminated and the cruel and unjust triumph in wealth and glory. If these souls could speak today, billions of voices thundering in unison would triumph. Resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. Yes! We have a message for today's tyrants. They may try, but we will never lay down our arms and become helpless to your rule. We will not be quiet. We will not go quietly to a fate you choose, and we will not surrender our freedom. God bless liberty, and God help us if we sit by idly and do nothing. Uh, what a speech, everybody. Okay, this next guy, he's a blogger known as the International Libertarian. He was the guest speaker of the year for Citizens for Liberty, Darren Wolf. So I'd, like I'd like to mix it up. We have conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, everybody. Thank you, Adam. Thank you all for coming out. Great to see you all carrying a little liberty around with you. Well, Dan, you ruined my speech. I was going to talk about Venezuela. <laughs> but, I used to live there. So anyways, I can make my speech shorter now, because Dan already covered it. <laughs> so, well, I'll just jump right into something else. I'm going to talk about something that's a little unusual for me, which is the Constitution. We're here, this is a Second, second Amendment Awareness Rally, so let's talk about that. The Second Amendment is actually part of a line that runs through the Constitution. It starts well into the beginning of it and runs right past the Second Amendment. And that line starts, well let me start with the Second Amendment. It is a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state. And let me stop there. I want to look at that part of the Second Amendment. The part that a lot of people overlook. The line starts Article 1, Section 8, Clause 12. To support, and this is the powers of Congress, to, to raise and support <laughs> armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. Remember, the Anti-Federalists didn't want a standing army. They wanted Congress to have to consider every two years whether there should even be an army. But what was to defend the United States? But the militia. We go on, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 gives Congress the power to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. That is the law enforcement power of the federal government. Not to have the FBI, the ATF, the Securities Exchange Commission, and all the, uh, the Internal Revenue Service. We can't forget that you shouldn't have that one. It's not to have all those things. It says here, militia to execute the laws of the union. That's all it says. Number 16, uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16, gives Congress the power to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States. So the federal government is supposed to help the states have state militias. Instead, in 1903, with something called the Dick Act, they destroyed the militia and substituted, sort of substituted a National Guard. It also says in Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1, this is presidential powers. The president shall be commander-in-chief of the Army and the Navy of the United States and the militia of the several states when called into actual service of the United States. Making very clear the militias are supposed to be state organizations, not federal, not a reserve, not an army-type reserve like the National Guard. Well. 
We then get to the Second Amendment itself, which I don't need to read again. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with it. Every line that runs through the Constitution ends in one place, and that is the Tenth Amendment. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. So we go back. Remember I said, what's the militia for? To execute the laws of the Union. We see that that line is broken. We see that our rights are trampled. What we see is that the Constitution has failed. We, the Constitution has failed. I know a lot of you don't want to hear this, but we tried, we really did. But think about it. The Constitution either authorizes the government we now have, or it has failed to prevent it. But that's a, that's a real reality we have to face. The Constitution has become a means of controlling us, not a means of controlling the government. Think about it. When you, when you cling to the idea that we can vote people into office to make things better, to restore the Constitution, to restore the Republic, you stay under control. You keep obeying laws. You keep paying taxes. When you thank that officer, or wherever he went, when you thank that officer for his service, you're thanking him for tyranny. Yep. 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 Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Police state. Okay. I was expecting tomatoes for some of those. Yeah. Oh, and you said, well, I would like to quote the same speech that Johan quoted from Patrick Henry, where he talked about what was wrong with the Constitution. I want to emphasize the title of the speech is Shall Liberty or Empire Be Sought? And Patrick Henry was arguing against the adoption of the Constitution at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. Here's what he had to say. There will be no checks, no real balances in this government. What can avail your specious, imaginary balances, your rope-dancing, chain-rattling, ridiculous, ideal checks and contrivances? It is on a supposition that your American governors shall be honest that all the good qualities of this government are founded. But its defective and imperfect construction puts it in their power to perpetrate the worst of mischiefs, should they be bad men. And sir, would not all the world blame our distracted folly in resting our rights upon the contingency of our rulers being good or bad? Show me that age and country where the rights and liberties of the people were placed on the sole chance of their rulers being good men without a consequent loss of liberty. I say that the loss of that dearest privilege has ever followed with absolute certainty every such mad attempt. And it happened here too. Let me ask a question of this crowd. When do you say Molo Mave? When do you say Molo Mave? Every time I get the chance. When do you say it? When no cops are around. Take them. Take what? When powers of government come to take your weapons, you tell them, come and take me. Okay, if you're going to wait until they come for your guns, it's too late. You may as well just turn them in. They've already won. If you give them the power to tax you, any tax, you're giving them the power to confiscate your money. Now you have a principle there. They can confiscate things from you. If you give them the power to do things like eminent domain. Now I know a lot of people in this crowd don't like eminent domain. It certainly is the mainstream out there. Matter of fact, I found out while we were fighting eminent domain in Phoenixville that eminent domain comes from two Latin words that mean supreme lordship. Um, I don't think they exercise any supreme lordship over me. I don't think you guys uh, feel that way either. But we have taxation, we have eminent domain, we've established a principle. They can confiscate from us. And if we allow them to confiscate anything, they can confiscate everything. We don't have a leg to stand on when we say, you can't take our guns. Let me close with an idea from the 19th century libertarian anarchist, 
Lysander Spooner. He wrote, every man who puts money into the hands of a government, so-called, puts into its hands a sword which will be used against himself to extort more money from him and also to keep him in subjugation to its arbitrary will. We might be able to achieve liberty one day, but it's only going to happen when the tax man comes to you and says, I want your money, and then you say, Molo Lave! Thank you. Thank you, Darren. That was very well said. Good one. My next, sorry, my next speaker, he's the founder of the Pennsylvania Sheriff's Brigade, William Tyler Ryle. I hope I said your name right, sir. Thank you, Adam. I love, I love Darren. Well, we always have some interesting discussions. Um, I'm a lover of uh, freedom and liberty and, frankly, uh, the law. And uh, the Framers were probably a collection of the most brilliant men at the time, and I don't know that many of us have passed them since then. That's the Framers of the state constitution and then the federal constitution. Remember that the state constitution came first. And in fact, the people of the states created the central government by ratifying the Constitution. And the Creator is always, is always superior to the creation. That's right. Yeah. So the state government that the people created is superior to the federal government, which we no longer have. And it's not because the constitutions have failed, in all due respect. It's because we, the people, have failed the duty to keep it free to keep this country free and demand that those who work for us understand what their job is and it's defined in the state constitution and the other founding documents and the constitution of the united states and when patrick henry made that statement he was absolutely right and what was the remedy that the ratifying conventions came up with they made over 200 i understand recommended amendments and they got boiled down by Madison and others to uh, 17 in the House and 12 in the Senate. The 12 prevailed. They were sent to the states for ratification, and the last 10 were ratified on December 15, 1791, became the Bill of Rights. That was the check. And what has failed us is the leadership of certain attorneys certain judges and certain professors of law to pervert the meaning of the Constitution and, and brainwash us to a point where we think that we got to obey what they say. This is absolutely the source of our problem. And of course, of course they're working for bankers and politicians and others. Somebody told me once we have the best government money can buy. Point being is, if we don't do our job and insist that those who work for us we get what we deserve. So, by all means, don't throw the constitutions out. Understand them. Look at the state constitution declaration of rights. Look at Article 1, Section 21. What does it say? The right of the citizens to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state shall not be questioned. And I wrote a paper that says, shall not be questioned means exactly what it says. And on the website, careforgaysofpen.com, and start reading some of these things, and I think you'll be uh, help. And then I'd recommend that you take those documents, because we've given 55 of them to the governor and every state senator and every representative on a variety of subjects. They're listed on the website. And three or four of you go and meet with the senators and representatives, your senator. Whether you like him or not, he's there and instruct the guy who works for us on subjects of law. I always get told, that's a federal issue. We can't do anything about it. So I wrote a paper, The True Meaning of the Supremacy Clause. Go to read it. They just don't understand because they're lied to. Or they want to be lied to. It doesn't matter. 
but they're supposed to work for us, but we sit around and complain about it. We got to get in their face. Fortunately, go sit down with them. They'll tell you they haven't gotten this document or they don't understand or the attorneys tell them this or that. But if we're the boss and we're supposed to be, we're only going to preserve our rights if we defend them. Now, the ultimate defense is, of course, war. That is the last resort. Until we exercise our authority to tell those who work for us, this is the law, don't listen to the courts, they don't know and they don't care, they're not the authority, we are. And the Constitution reflects our authority. And if it says what it says, and means what it says, and it hadn't been changed, it isn't a, li a legal document, uh, I mean a, a living document, it's a legal document, and it means what it meant when it was written, just like every other legal document. So understand what they meant, the framers meant. The Second Amendment, by the way, applies to federal jurisdictions. It does not apply within the state or to you. Everybody likes that catchy say, phrase, the Second Amendment. It's sort of like uh, constitutional rights. There are no constitutional rights. They're your rights, and the Constitution protects them. When, when those who work for us do their job, what should you be asking the candidate? Have you read the state constitution? They got to take an oath if they get elected within a few days, 30 days, which by the way, that's wrong, done wrong too. But anyway, um, to support, obey, and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this Commonwealth and to discharge the duties of their office with fidelity. Every state officer takes that and anybody who, who works for the state is responsible to it. The federal con the oath is different. But everybody that's going to be running here and going to Harrisburg, for example, or here in the county, takes that oath. <coughs> if they haven't read it, can you tell me how in the world they can take that oath? How in the world can we let them do that? Ask them, people who are in office, did you get elected? Did you take an oath? Do you get paid? Then why aren't you doing your job? Yeah. According to the Constitution. All right? The Constitution has been changed unconstitutionally. 1776 is the only valid one, That's if you want to learn more about that. The Federal Constitution has been changed unconstitutionally. The so-called 14th Amendment isn't law. There's a lot to learn. And the people behind it, in all due respect to attorneys and judges, who by and large don't know, has been driven and controlled by certain attorneys certain judges, and certain professionals of law. If you want to go to the point as to how to stop this, get the courthouses under control. Then you can go and prosecute anybody who fails. The jury's got to be independent. we got to have independent grand juries that are controlled by the law. Anyway, get involved and understand. If you need help, uh, please visit the website. The right to bear arms is a guaranteed God-given right of defense. And I'd like for a little history for you to remember, and I'll wind this up. What were the British troops doing when they were going to Con Lexington and Concord? After what the powder. They were, doing? they were going to get the arms and the ammunition. Just like Darren said, every tyrant, go back as far as you want to go, does this because if you can defend yourself, they lose. There are more of us than there are of them. And oh, by the way, they got all these guns. The law says you can have any weapon that the government has. Any weapon. Because the reason those provisions are in the state constitution and the federal constitution is so that we can protect ourselves against a tyrannical government. It has very little to do with hunting and target shooting. Depends on, I guess, who you're hunting. Anyway, the point being is, you can have a tank in your driveway ready to use, but you must be responsible for it, and it must be kept under your control. That's the difference. The cannons on Lexington and Concord were owned by people. They weren't community property. Think about it.
read and study. If you need help, let me know. Thank you so very much. God bless you. All right, I'm so ready to buy a tank now. Okay, this final speaker, when, in the beginning of the event, when I was putting it together, I was messaging a lot of people and I said, who should I have for my main keynote speaker? And a bunch of people gave me this guy's name. His name is Joshua Prince. He works yeah. Yes. I, don't, I don't think he needs an introduction. Everyone knows him. He works for the Prince Law Firms and the Firearm Industry Consulting Group. Everyone give it up for Joshua Prince. I've never been told to be soft-spoken, so I'm going to try and forego this. Right. If anyone has any difficulties hearing me, please just speak up. <laughs> I know everyone's anxious for the rally walk or, or march, so I know we're running a little bit late here, so I'm not going to take too much of your time, but I want to touch on a couple of topics that have been spoken about earlier today. The first one I want to touch on is the idea that the Constitution is a living, breathing document. This is not the case. And anyone who proposes that, I suggest you ask them one simple, simple question. If it is a living, breathing document, why do we have an amendment process? There would be no need. And if you ask someone that, they won't have an answer for you because no answer exists. There would be no purpose to have an amendment process if the Constitution could evolve. <coughs> and that's the end of the story. Now, of course, I propose that those rights that were listed in the Bill of Rights are inalienable rights, not rights which the government can take away or that anyone could even amend out of existence. There were other issues that the Founding Fathers wanted to ensure the people could in the future amend the Constitution. Therefore, I would propose that the forefathers never intended for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, or tenth amendment to ever be amended, but rather so that the people in the future could add additional amendments and change other aspects of the Constitution, which were not inalienable rights. Now, the other issue I want to talk about is the upcoming primary season. Too frequently, we do not get involved in primaries. Everyone says they're primaries. It is won or lost at the primaries. The candidates that are going to support our rights get excluded from the general election based on primaries. You need to get involved. We can all find five or ten more minutes to learn about those people who are running and talk with our friends, neighbors, family members, those around us about their beliefs. If we are going to change where we are headed currently, we all need to take responsibility and do it to, as a collective. We all need to come together, we all need to learn, and we all need to exchange our knowledge, even with those who might not be ready to hear it. Now the other issue I want to talk about and really links itself in with the primaries is judicial activism. Because many people in the Commonwealth are surprised to learn we elect our judges. Unlike federal judges that are appointed, we elect our judges. We have control over who our judges are. And every 10 years they come up for retention. How many judges have never been retained in the Commonwealth? Does anyone know? One. One is right. There has only been, in the history of the Commonwealth, one judge, and it was a Supreme Court justice, that was not retained, and it was immediately after they had voted to sustain a, a pay increase. The people remembered it, and that uh, judge, unfortunately, was up for retention that year and was not retained. Had that judge run any other time, I will put it on the line and say that judge would have been retained, without any doubt in my mind. <coughs> so we all need to know the judges that are in office as well as those that are running for office. And 
why I'm spending this time talking about this, some of you may have heard of a little case called Erie. It was yeah. Justin Dillon versus City of Erie. And the City of Erie had an ordinance that said that no one could have a firearm in a city park. And Justin had a number of rallies in the park, never had a problem. And he sought to have another rally there, and all of a sudden, the town solicitor says, you know what, you can't. Because we have this ordinance from 1973 that says no one can possess a firearm in the city parks. And we contacted, we said, hold on, there's a state preemption statute that specifically says no municipality may regulate in any manner the possession, transport, and several other things of firearms and ammunition. Pretty clear. The ordinance itself says you can't possess a firearm. The statute itself says you can't regulate possession. Seems pretty clear. The city decided to say, yeah, too bad. So we filed a civil action asking the court in Erie to grant an injunction. It went before President Judge DeSantis in Erie Court of Common Pleas, and he said, you know what? The law isn't very clear to me. It isn't very clear that it prohibits the city ordinance. And what was so enlightening was his decision on the matter. In his decision, he specifically left out the word possession from the ordinance in his decision. Because there was no way for him to get around that word. It had a bunch of other words in it, but he specifically left that word out of the exact text of the ordinance. And so the rally occurred. It was civil disobedience. The police came. Eight people were charged criminally for violating the ordinance. <coughs> we took an appeal up to the Commonwealth Court, but the criminal prosecution started. We went in front of a magisterial district judge because they were summary offenses. We said to the judge, look, judge, there's an ordinance here that prohibits this. The judge says, eh, I don't know. We said, judge, you just heard all these police officers testify. What did these police officers testify to? They saw several people in the park with something that looked like a firearm on their hip. When I inquired of whether any one officer asked any one of the participants of whether they were carrying a firearm, the officers said no. When I asked all the officers if they actually divested that person of a firearm or alleged firearm to see if it was a firearm, they all responded in the negative. The Commonwealth can't meet its burden that there was a firearm in the park. It could have been an aerosoft gun. It could have been a toy gun. It could have been anything. Yep. And what did the magisterial district judge do? Guilty. All eight. And so we had to appeal that up to the Erie Court of Common Pleas. Meanwhile, the Commonwealth Court comes down February 7th with its decision holding that the ordinance is invalid and that the injunction had to be granted, that it was clear based on the law that the ordinance violated the law. But judicial activism did not end there. No, the Commonwealth Court too decided to get involved with a little bit of judicial activism. There has become known the infamous footnote nine where the Commonwealth Court says, well, the city of Erie didn't raise this, but ostensibly we could see where the city of Erie might be able to regulate this as a civil issue instead of as a criminal issue. The issue was never brought before the court and the court cites a regulation that says that in state parks, you can't carry a firearm for the proposition, well, that maybe the municipalities can do the same. The problem with the ordinance that the, or actually, excuse me, the regulation that the Commonwealth Court cites to, that's also invalid under a different statutory section, section 6109 M.3, that says that no agency of the Commonwealth may regulate the possession of firearms inconsistently with the rest of the Uniform Firearms Act. And that is the reason why courts are not supposed to address issues that are not before them, because they don't have the briefs and all the information on those issues to decide them. I heard just last week that all the criminal charges are being null-prossed, meaning they're withdrawing the prosecution on them. 
they had no other choice because the Commonwealth Court has declared that the preliminary injunction had been granted. I also received notice from President Judge DeSantis saying, it seems like it's a fait accompli. I might as well issue one order granting both the preliminary injunction and the permanent injunction because it seems like the city would not be able to prevail on the permanent injunction issue either. So the ordinance is now invalid, but we've had multiple levels of our courts become involved in judicial activism. We need to know who's running for office. We need to know who's in office and whether we need to retain them. We are responsible. The judges in office are not. We are the ones that continue to put them in that position. And when we've had enough, it is on us to have them removed from office. And that's why it is so important that everyone know about the judges that are in office currently and those that are running. Now, I've focused on judicial activism and judges and the court system, but it extends far beyond that. We need to know what politicians are running because they are in charge, generally speaking, of what's going to occur in relation to our rights. Although the Constitution is supposed to give us this, these inalienable rights, and it's not the Constitution that gives it, but rather a higher power that gives it and merely the Constitution reflects those inalienable rights, the legislature has deemed fit to regulate them anyway, in any way that it wants. So you need to know who's running for office in any one season so that we can ensure that we elect those who will support our rights. And saying that, there is one legislative uh, bill I would highly suggest you all look into. It's called House Bill 2011. It would change our preemption statute, the statute that was dealt with in Erie to actually include for attorney's fees. Uh, right now, there is no way for someone who wants to challenge an illegal ordinance to do it, even if successful, and get their court costs or their attorney's fees back. And so it's much needed. Daryl Metcalf in the past had, uh, I believe it was House Bill 805, that was a version of it. Uh, right now, uh, it's being promoted by a different representative as House Bill 2011. Please call your state representatives and find out if they'll support it. We really need it. With that all being said, let's go have fun on the march. Alright, everybody, this is the fun part, the march. So I'm thinking we'll start down right at the light, cross the street, and then go down to the...